Thanks for last night, by the way. It was absolutely my pleasure. Oh, and by the way, thank you for accommodating the time for today. <laughs> my time is your time. Uh, so what was the genesis? We saw that yesterday. What was the genesis of pulling together that uh, FCC versus Pacifica? Well, the, the panel came from the fact that that's one of my least favorite Supreme Court cases of all time. Mm -hmm. Add to that, I mean, last year's panel, I, you were there, you saw it, was on the Lenny Bruce issues and the problems he had with the law. Uh, Kelly Car uh, Carlin is very active with the Comedy Center, so I saw that as a possible resource. So I suggested to them that this would kind of be a good follow-up to that one, because it's kind of the next step. We've gone from persecuting individual comedians for what they say to persecuting radio stations for what the comedians say. But I mean, and as, as harsh as that sounds, it actually is an evolution in the right direction. I mean, other than the, the one incident in uh, Wisconsin, George at least never got arrested for doing the routine. I mean, I saw him do it at Carnegie Hall back in the 70s, and that was perfectly fine. But WBAI, not so fine. Well, it's interesting when you talk about Summerfest in Milwaukee. I was there this past year as my daughter lives in Milwaukee. I had no idea that there was a historical context <laughs> to that big uh, brew and brought type, mm. type event. Was law part of your world? Was your family involved in that? that I have an uncle uh, since passed away who was a lawyer. Uh, but no, the reality is... I was one of those, you know, kids who had glasses, even in kindergarten, with a big vocabulary, and everybody said, you're going to be a lawyer, and I listened to them. Uh, there was actually one short time during college where I thought about going into public administration, and my father, in an event that he doesn't remember but I couldn't explain, said, you're giving up your birthright. And it's like, you're not a lawyer, what are you talking about? But I have always gravitated here out of both an interest in the number of things you can do, I'm one of those who likes helping people do stuff. I'm active in a variety of causes. And it is, it, lawyers are the shame, you know this, lawyers are the shaman of society. If it's not medical and there's a problem, it's call the lawyer. They'll figure it out. And I've always enjoyed that kind of puzzle. Here's a situation. How do we get out of it? And because I do crossword puzzles and brain teasers and all those things. And law lets you do that for a living, and that's fun. <laughs> So, where, where was hometown for you? Where were you born? Born, bred, and raised in New York City. I was born in Queens, New York, Jackson Heights. Uh, at age 11, my parents kidnapped me and took me to the suburbs and held me there for seven years, uh, at which point I escaped and went to college back in the city. I went to Columbia undergrad and Yeshiva University's law school, Cardozo, for law. And then I stayed in the city for most of my life. About a decade ago, uh, my now wife, uh, the fiance, and I moved back up here because she's from Ithaca. And we've been living in Ithaca for about a decade, which was a bit of an adjustment for me. The nice thing is my practice, I'm an entertainment and intellectual property lawyer, is worldwide. I have clients all over the world. But I could move that to Ithaca because I rarely saw anybody in person even when I was in the city. They call my old phone number, it rings to my cell phone in my pocket, and many of them don't even realize I've left. Yeah. I don't think I could have built the practice in, uh, in central New York, but I could certainly maintain it there. So, uh, why entertainment? I mean, it's just, uh, it was just, I mean, you got a lot of things that you can, you, you're, you're kind of got a very gregarious person, you can go in a whole lot of areas of litigation. Uh, why did you gravitate towards entertainment? Oh, that is the great question, isn't it? Uh, I was always one of, the, I've been attracted to comedy, I've been attracted to acting, I was one of those drama counselor, campers, and then later a drama counselor as a kid. Uh, I don't know why so many people want to practice entertainment law. Uh, I teach it now, I've known a lot of people, I get calls regularly from folks who want to do it. Uh, they don't let you get on stage and perform with them, I know because I've asked, and they've <laughs> said no. Uh, on the other hand, when you're walking down the street and you run into somebody you went to high school, college, or law school with and say, what are you doing? You, know, you say, well, you know, I'm working with Bobby McFerrin, or I'm you know, heading out to uh, see this performance. You win the argument. I mean, you just win as opposed yeah, to, I'm working for a shoe manufacturer. Okay. Uh, perfectly legitimate to work for a shoe manufacturer. But I always gravitated towards the entertainment industry. I didn't actually want to be a performer. 
I mean, I, I have sung with choruses. I have acted in you know community and amateur things. But being able to work in that community uh, attracted me. I didn't start there. Almost nobody starts in entertainment law. I started at a firm that did Medicare Med and Medicaid law for nursing homeowners. Mm -hmm. I lasted nine months mm -hmm. because my job was to get them more money for fewer services and I couldn't sleep at night. Yeah, yeah. From there I went to a small general practice firm uh, where I did everything, you know, from divorces to securities registrations. If it walked through the door with a check, we took it. And from there I went to an intellectual property firm and kind of started to find my niche. And from there, I became an entertainment lawyer, which was then the number two music firm in the country, what I call the big time, big deal music firm. And uh, I was there for five years, and went out on my own, which I've been doing for over 25 years now. What was the aha moment when some entertainer, could be a musician, a comic, comes in and you kind of eyeball them for the first time and say, hmm, I kind of like dealing with that kind of personality? Well, that's a great question. I, I hmm. I'm not sure it goes to the practice of law. I have a lot of friends who are actors, who are musicians. Uh, I mean, long before I was a lawyer, I had friends who were, who were in the arts, uh, you know, having dabbled in that myself. I've always liked those kind of creative people. A little weird, you know, a little quirky, a little fun, overly emotional. Uh, but, you know, it, but it was, it, I liked the people. And the nice thing about entertainment law in the practice is you're not really locked into one thing. I've always defined entertainment law as general law for a specialized clientele. I mean, I one day had Paul Stanley of KISS walk into my office and ask why there was no rock star exception for jury duty. <laughs> and I had to explain to him, you're not that important. That's, that's why. Uh, because entertainers have all the same needs as normal people. Uh, they get married, they get divorced, they need wills, they buy houses, uh, you know, they have slip and falls. And you have to be able to deal with all of that, or at least know when to send it to somebody else, as well as you know, the record industry contract, or the agreement for the movie, or whatever, or the licensing deal, or whatever it may be. So it is, as many lawyers experience, not just in my area, a very diverse practice where every day can be different. And what I've been able to get out of it as well is because of the people I deal with and the people I know because of it, I've been able to do creative projects of my own. I've produced several records, a few DVDs, uh, I've done some stand-up comedy, uh, and you know, people let me because you know, they've gotten to know me on the lawyer's side. I, mean, I wouldn't have been able to do last night's panel if I hadn't been a lawyer. Uh, and so. You, as long as you can find those those opportunities professionally, professionally adjacent, you know, it's it's never dull. It's frequently, though certainly not always, fun, uh, and it's almost always a challenge of some sort. I, my my week on Tuesday, I was in court in the Southern District of New York, and I beat Viacom oh. on a motion. Uh, this was truly a David and Goliath situation. Then my wife and I hopped in the car and drove six and a half hours and got here, same day. And you know, last night we did the panel, and the rest of the week I get to just sit back and enjoy comedy. Yeah. Uh, but there, there was no one aha moment. It was always, it was kind of an evolution. I wanted to be a lawyer. Then I kind of figured out I wanted to be an entertainment lawyer. I took the courses that would lead me to it. I made friends. I became an entertainment lawyer because my law school dean was the person that my soon-to-be boss called and said, I have an opening, do you know anybody? And they, the uh, assistant director of the placement office and I had been uh, section mates first year of law school. And Nancy knew I was looking. And Nancy said to Monroe, Howard's looking. Howard called, uh, Monroe called Paul. Paul called me. A week later, I was an entertainment lawyer. That's perfect. So talk about it. Let me back up. I, last week at Chautauqua, they had a whole bunch of comedy at Chautauqua Institution, and one of them was a, a Reverend Susan Sparks. Susan Sparks is a comedian, stand-up comedian, Baptist minister, trial lawyer. It sounds like the beginning of a joke. <laughs> or, or a sitcom. Yeah. <laughs> they got me. So, I, of course, I did what I'm doing here with her. And uh, similarly, you know, it's she, as a lawyer, 
had the moment where there was kind of an open mic mo moment where, you know, I think I can do that, having watched a few people, and you did it. Did you, is that same experience with you? Uh, a little different, but not terribly. I, I've been a student of comedy since I was a kid. My parents had two Alan Sherman records that I listened to over and over. Uh, when I was six years old, my grandmother, whom I adored and who adored me, bought me a record, Homer and Jethro at the Country Club. Uh, totally inappropriate for a six-year-old. Not, I mean, not uh, coarse or whatever, but there was no way I was going to get the jokes. But with both the Alan Sherman and that, I grew into the jokes. I would listen to them, I would hear people laughing, and that sound of people laughing was such an amazing experience. Uh, and the concept as, that I started to figure out that you could make someone laugh. You could, and you know, I did what everybody does. I made family laugh, you know, I put on shows for the relatives when they come over. Uh, flash forward a few decades, uh, I had been collecting comedy records. I have about 5,000 of them. Uh, I had done a comedy radio show, I mean, uh, several at that point. I'd been critiquing comedy for years, and I decided I should try stand-up comedy. And so you know, I was in the city. I'm a middle-class white Jewish boy from, uh, from New York City. I took a course. Uh, the new school was just starting to give a course in how to do stand-up comedy with a guy named Scott Blakeman. I took his very first class. John Stewart took a second one. If I'd waited six months, I could be on The Daily Show now. But Scott was very good in easing us into it. You know, do a minute, three minutes, now five minutes. He was also the head MC at the comic strip. So he would put us on. You know, on the open mic nights, you didn't have to pull a number. He'd just put us on, or on a slow night, he would do that. So I spent about a year on the audition trail doing that. And then I'd been out there, you know, I, would, I was having more middle to good nights than bad nights at this point. And the, the guy who could pass you at the strip, very famous man by the name of Lucian Holt, famous in comedy circles, I got him to watch my act, that by itself was a success, just getting him to watch. And I came off stage, and I went over, I said, what do you think? He said, there's something there. Another 70 or 80 sets, and you really might have something. <laughs> and the thought of doing another 70 or 80 sets so made my stomach go, that I, I quit. <laughs> that was it. I was about to go out the next time, I'm you know, pre-taping myself to practice. Uh, in my head, I go, do I really have to go do this? And I remembered, no, I don't really have to. I have a job. I'm a lawyer. I make a good income. Uh, and that's when I gave it up. But I actually, two weeks ago, part of my very hectic two weeks, we had an event in Ithaca at uh, Cinemopolis, our not-for-profit arts theater, where I'm on the board and chair the program committee. And this is the third year that we've done Fool's Flicks Fest where we have films and events about the art of comedy. And this year, in fact, the National Comedy Center was a presenting sponsor as well. I'd like to bring things together. Sure. And at the end of Fool's Flicks, what we've done each year is we've had live stand-up. And this year, the guy who put it together couldn't be there to MC. He had another gig. And I, somewhat manipulatively, sent him an email that said, so, who do you think should MC? <laughs> and he took the bait and emailed back, you know, you'd be great at that. So I spent several weeks going insane, coming up with uh, about 15 minutes of material, which I did, and I certainly wasn't Lewis Black, uh, but nobody booed me off the stage either. Yeah. So after 33 years, I did stand up again, and in another 30 years or so, maybe I'll do it again. <laughs> what did you learn by that experience? I mean, you critique comedians, you met comedians as late as last night with two successful comedians and Lou Black and Mark Russell. Uh, what did you learn about the craft? I'm not sure how much I learned about it by doing it. I mean, I have been watching stand-up intently. I mean, not just sitting in the audience, but studying it, listening to records over and over, different comedians, different styles. I pride myself on being able to say, that's funny, even if it I don't like, like Stephen Wright. I think he's a genius. I think he's you know, hysterically funny for the right person, but he doesn't work for me. But I know that's me, that's not him. Uh, doing it, I think you learn how incredibly difficult it is. Uh, th there's a reason they call it performing naked from the waist up. The 
Stand-up is the hardest form of performing there is because there is no such thing as polite laughter. The worst singer in the world, you know, will always go, tomorrow, tomorrow, and if they finish and everybody goes, thank God it's over, I'm so happy it's over. But they get that applause. The stand-up knows second by second how they are doing. And when it's going well, I've had a few nights, not many, but a few, where it's gone really well. It is the most mind-blowing sensation you know. You are controlling this audience of strangers and making them laugh, giving them pleasure. It's a, such a positive, benevolent form of control. Mm -hmm. On the nights it's going bad, you walk off stage, you grab your tape recorder, your cassette recorder, and, or I'm dating myself now, your digital recorder, uh, and you walk out and you really believe that you have no value in the universe whatsoever. <laughs> Uh, and then you remind yourself that there are people in the world who love you when you go on with your life. Yeah, call your family. <laughs> so, like like last night, you, you could just see Lou Black. I mean, it just, within seconds, somehow, he can turn a serious subject with just a turn of the phrase, mm -hmm. partly because of his reputation, but just a little, and the fact he's you know a little rant, but he, he gets the house just on her knees. Uh, does that marvel you? I mean, do you just sit there in awe and say, wow? Well, yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, he has several things going for him. One, he's incredibly funny, so that's number one. Two, he has a reputation. Uh, and, and I don't say that to belittle or demean him in any way. He earned that yeah, reputation. Yeah, yeah. But when you walk into a room with Louis Black or Robert Klein or whoever it may be, you expect you're going to laugh. You're there primed to laugh. In fact, that's the only reason you're there is because you know you're going to laugh. Yeah. When you go, my wife and I went to the Comedy Cellar a, uh, a couple of weeks ago when we were in the city. Uh, and the comedians were very good. They, we, we enjoyed all of them, which is unusual. But when you go and you hear a comic that you don't know, a lot of people have the attitude of, go ahead, make me laugh. I dare you. You know, I'm, I'm going to sit here and you've got the job. Whereas with Lewis or whomever, it's like, yeah, you're going to make me laugh. Thank you. That's why I'm here. But Lewis also has, as most of the better comedians have, and he talked about this yesterday in his, the five o'clock thing he did on how to be a stand-up. Uh, I, I know your wife was there. We sat next yeah, to her, yeah, actually. Yeah. And uh, we learned that after the fact. And he pointed out that it takes years to find your voice. And not everybody does. Not everybody has a comedic voice. I, I know I have not found mine. Uh, I can write jokes. My, I can work a microphone and work a room, and you know I have a certain amount of delivery. I mean, I was trying using that last night, uh, but I don't have a distinctive comedic voice. Uh, I, I, I am enough of a student of comedy to know that I am not a great comedian, but that's okay. I mean, that's that's not how I'm trying to make my my living. I I do it more like. The, uh, the, the football enthusiast goes out and plays football with his friends because they want that experience. Oh, that's a very big picture of me. <laughs> Along those lines, you put together a four CD compilation entitled, But Seriously, The American Comedy Box, which traced the history of American recorded comedy from its roots in the early 1900s to the 1990s. First of all, how did you find it? How did you find comedy back that far? Well, I owned it at the time, for yeah. the most part. As I say, I, at this point, have about 5,000 comedy records, and they're not all LPs. They're, they're 45s, they're 78s, they're CDs. Uh, that was put out by the people who were then at Rhino. They're now Shout Factory. They were the people who put me in business for myself. Mm -hmm. And Richard Foos, who was the president of Rhino, now Shout Factory, wanted to do this project. They did a lot of comedy stuff. And he knew my experience with especially recorded comedy. And so he, he was kind enough to ask me to put it together. And we, I sat down and I kind of sketched it out as I do my radio shows thematically. We have the monologists. We have a set on comedy duos. Uh, there, are, there are several others like that. And then we treated it historically. I mean, it is designed to be a historical run through comedy. Uh, we start back with the two black crows and Sam and Henry. Uh, the two black crows, you could not do that today. It was two white guys doing black voice. Um, 
but from a historical point of view, you can't pretend it didn't exist. And it was the first, there was 78s, we were LPs yet, they hadn't been invented, we're talking like 1922. Uh, it was the first recording to sell enough that if they had had them, it would have gotten a gold record. Mm -hmm. That also hadn't been invented yet. Uh, we had Cal Stewart, uh, who kind of did a country bumpkin character on lots and lots of 78s. Edison had discovered him. And we moved forward to, I think, Robin Williams in 1992 or 3 was the most current one, because this was done in the mid-90s. Uh, tracing, in my view, some of the development of different areas of comedy. And, you know, it, not everything, I mean, Cal Stort would be seen as corny as you could get today. The Two Black Crows would be offensive today. Uh, we had a, a track, Sam and Henry, which is Amos and Andy before they created Amos and Andy. Same guys. They were on a different radio network which claimed those characters, and when they moved to CBS, they had to change the names. Again, I, I am not endorsing that, but for, in terms of looking at the roots of American comedy, yeah, yeah. you know, you, you can't say that that didn't exist any more than because slavery was evil, we shouldn't examine slavery. I mean, it's, it's part of what we did and how we got to where we are and some of the ills of society. But that is what America was laughing at in the 19-teens and 1920s. Uh, and it was, it was truly a labor of love. It has to be. I made almost nothing on it. Uh, but it is, it is one of the things I am actually genuinely proud of. And the guys at Rhino did a great job. They packaged up in a package with a set of Groucho glasses that come out of the package. Uh, has a uh, booklet that comes with it that I wrote that explains all of the uh, various tracks, why they're important, why we included them. And uh, it's been out of print for years, but you can find it on eBay. And uh, you can. Uh, I find that history interesting because as, as things are all evolutionary, things build on it, you start with almost a base point, and then you kind of change it, change it, change it based on, I guess, community and interest and needs. Is there ever along that evolutionary process, going back to 1920s, where something just drops out meteoric, rather than being just on a, a timeline of things where it changes, it adjusts, it adjusts, where it just kind of drops straight down with no uh, pretext? That's not the correct term, maybe. I mean, context might be a context, better word. Yeah, yeah. uh, I would say no, but it, sometimes it looks like it does. Yeah. I mean, Lenny Bruce. If you, if you just see what he's doing, it looks completely different from what everybody else was doing at the time. And it would look like, fell out of the sky. But if you step back and see how he got to where he was, working up through the burlesque circuit, with a mother who was a stripper and worked through that, he took the jazz sounds, he took the, the, the burlesque idea and moved it over to comedy. And out of that, we get Lenny Bruce, and from Lenny Bruce, we get George Carlin and Richard Pryor, and from then we get Eddie Murphy, and, 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 and on and on it goes. Nothing comes out of nothing, but sometimes you've got to dig a little to find where it came from. Is that your, where you get your jollies, digging deep, kind of peeling back the onion, and why is that funny, kind of analyze it? Yes and no. I mean, I like to just sit back and enjoy the comedy, although... Truth be told, I'm sitting there trying to get to the punchline before the comedian does because, right. you know, I try not to say it out loud if I get if I come <laughs> it because that's really obnoxious. Uh, the only one it would you know interfere with is my wife, but you know I don't want to be obnoxious to her either. And but as I said, I try to I think I enjoy comedy on two different levels. I enjoy it just as humor. It's funny. It's not funny. Yay! I'm laughing. Hooray! And I think I also enjoy it as an art form in and of itself, just as somebody who does art appreciation or music appreciation can sit and discuss the influences that came into that and look how the, the music swells here, as opposed to just sitting back and letting it wash over you. And I don't think enough people, no, that's not true, more than enough people do it if they feel like it, nobody's stopping anybody, but appreciate comedy on that level. Most people view comedy as... It's funny, great, because we don't all sing. We can't all paint. We can't all dance. But it's the rare person who's never made anybody laugh. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. which is why open mics and all that did so well. Everybody, me included, felt like, I can get up there and do that. I mean, I've, I've, I, I made my parents laugh. I made my friends laugh. I can make those strangers laugh. How hard can it be? It's hard. It's very, very hard. But uh, it, it, the appreciation of comedy doesn't, re just as with art, or music doesn't require that you understand what a glissando is or how to plie or any of those things but I think it brings another level to it if you understand you know the history of it and you know why jokes come in threes and the K is the funniest consonant sound and that you know there's that pause there is not inadvertent the comedian's taking that pause to build the tension in the room and you know let you get to that laugh harder uh, or you know, where you recognize you know, looping back around to the original joke and know that they're doing that. And sometimes it can take away from it because you can anticipate what's coming. But even then, the payoff is like, ha, ah, I was right, look what they did. Uh, so yeah, I think appreciating it at all those levels is, is acceptable and, and appropriate. Yeah, I think of the, going to a baseball game, I'm a baseball fan, and once in a while you go to the game and you got a scout next to you. <laughs> And I'm a fan, I appreciate what's going on there, but I don't understand the nuances. And so, you know, you could say, wow, that was a great pitch, you know, the guy just got caught straight out. You got the scout simply with the gun saying, no, nah, it was flat, it was this, it was that, it was a bad swing. You know, you got to kind of take it away because you have this an analyst mm -hmm. aspect of it. And I just was worried, wondering about that in the entertainment world as well. Uh, I don't. I don't find that. I mean, I, at least for me, I can't speak for anybody else. And perhaps the scout is so busy looking at, and for it's his job, the technical aspects that he puts the artistic aspects aside. Yeah. Uh, whereas I'm, I'm looking for both because I, I, I have nothing to gain by <laughs> ignoring them. Well, last night you mentioned briefly that you had a Telford Taylor story. So I did. All right, uh, Telford Taylor is people who uh, participate in this great institution, probably know, uh, was Robert Jackson's deputy uh, pro uh, chief prosecutor at the Nuremberg trials and took over for him. Uh, Telford had an illustrious career. He uh, ran for governor of New York at one point. He was a leading lawyer. He taught at Columbia for years and years and years at the law school. And when I got to Cardozo Law, Yeshiva's Law School, uh, the school had just opened. I was the fourth graduating class, maybe fifth. And they were trying to get whatever faculty they could to give them a reputation. And they hired Telford. They didn't make him leave Columbia. <laughs> he got to stay at Columbia as well. But he was the shining light of the Cardozo faculty. He was in his 90s, I believe, at the time. Sharp as a tack. And he gave two courses, and I've been trying leading up to this to remember what the first one was, and I can't. Uh, but the second one was called Constitutional Jurisprudence. And what we were supposed to do was pick a Supreme Court case, up to us to pick which one, and analyze the litigation of that case, not just the outcome, but start at the beginning, and this is pre-internet, uh, this is you know, pre-Lexis and West law, they were just actually coming in at that moment. Uh, and analyze how it was done. I, being me, chose Pacifica, FCC versus Pacifica, 1960, I'm sorry, 1978. Uh, I had been at Columbia when it was decided. I was doing a radio show called The Laugh Track, which was a radio comedy show. I used to play Seven Dirty Words. Nobody ever complained, thankfully. Um, and once the ruling came out and I was aware of it, I had to stop. And a lot of other things became much harder to play hated this decision, still do, because it's. I still have a radio comedy show now on WRFI, Watkins Glen, Ithaca, and I can't play things there either. So I chose Pacific, and I went through and I analyzed all the litigation in it, and I will plug here as I plugged last night, if you really want to know about that, you can find that paper that I wrote for Telford Taylor in 1982 on my website, uh, courtjesterlegal.com. There's a click through there. You can read the background of how Pacifica screwed it up from the very beginning in so many ways. Uh, but we had to write this paper, but we also had to do an oral presentation. And so I had brought my cassette recorder, because that's how far back this goes, uh, with a copy of Carlin's Seven Dirty Words in. And, I played some of it, and I was being a bit of a wise ass. I'm 
figure the 93 year old is going to be a little edgy about having this language in his classroom, but he can't tell me not to, it's part of the case. Uh, so I play some of that and then I get to my presentation. And I had gone back and forth, and I decided I would recite the seven dirty words. You know, he's, he's in his 90s, but you know, he can't get mad at me for it. Uh, and yeah, I was pushing the envelope. And so I go, the seven dirty words are shit, piss, fuck, cunt, motherfucker. And I stumble. And he looks at me and goes, cocksucker and tits, Mr. Lee. I know my Pacifica. <laughs> I could have died right there. The man was brilliant. He was wonderful. He was funny. I enjoyed his classes. He was intimidating. I mean, don't get me wrong, I mean, I was a, th a 3L at the time, but I was intimidated by him. But I took every class he gave because you want that experience. And, you know, he was, you could see as he said it, even though I'm like there turning red because I'm blowing my presentation, although he gave me an A. Uh, I'm proud to say. You could see that he thought it was funny as hell that <laughs> this was going on in his classroom. Okay. So that's my Telford Taylor story oh, for that's you. That's fantastic. Did, did, did he stumble at all onto the Nuremberg? Did he talk about it? Never. And I did not know that about him, frankly, until afterwards when I did some research on him. Because he, at the, just prior to that time period, he'd written a book on Nuremberg and also the Vietnam War. He sort of combined, combined all that. Uh, if you were to sit down and had dinner sometime with five folks, let's say, oh, no. five, five comedians of uh, any genre, any time period, who, who would you invite? Your wife would be there, and then... Well, she would be one of the comedians. So that's <laughs> uh, all right. Fred Allen, mm -hmm. Carlin, definitely want him there. Uh, they don't have to be dead, or they can be? They be dead, sure, whatever. No, but they, they don't have they, to be they dead. They do not have to be, no. Uh, probably Robert Klein, who's my personal favorite. Uh, I invite Robin Williams, but nobody else would get a word in edgewise. Uh, I've met a lot of these people over the years and interviewed several, so I don't know that I need to bring them to dinner. Uh, Harry Morgan, Henry Morgan, not Harry Morgan. Harry Morgan was on MASH. Henry Morgan was the comedian. I met and interviewed him, but I think he would be a fantastic dinner companion. Hmm. It's so many people to take, who could take that. <laughs> Having just done it last night, I'll invite Mark Russell, because he was fun at dinner last night. <laughs> and and you, you have a nice array there of people who did it over different decades and different styles. And I think that's a dinner I might just shut up at and listen to people, yeah. which would be really unusual for me. <laughs> yeah, Mark's, Mark's become a real friend of, of our family. Uh, We'd met him a few times yeah. before this, uh, and I mean, I grew up listening to Mark's PBS specials, and I have some of his albums. And when I did stand-up comedy, I did political song parodies, oh, uh, because, as I said, when you finish singing, people will applaud. Yeah. And you know that was influenced by him, the Capitol Steps, Tom Lehrer, uh, all three of which I've met and spoken to at various times. So that's the nice thing about doing a radio comedy show. It gives you an excuse to meet these people. So I've met Shelley and interviewed Shelley Berman and Tom Lair and Stan Freeberg and, and others over the years. Freeberg might be interesting at dinner, too. Uh, was there something kind of a disappointment? It was, he was a named comedian, but when he, he got to a serious conversation, there, there's the stage persona. They're on there, and they, 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 are, they got it. And then all of a sudden, there's this behind-the-mic persona. Anybody that sort of kind of surprised you? Dangerous question, but I'll answer it anyway. Shelley Berman, brilliant. It was, it was not like we sat down and he was like, oh, I don't know. Brilliant, but very bitter. I mean, I interviewed him. I can't say at the end of his career, because he went on for several decades after that. He was still performing when he died a few years ago at 92 or 93 years old. But he was clearly somebody who felt he'd never achieved what he should have achieved, didn't achieve what his, many of his peers had, whether it was you know, Nichols and May or Mort Saul or whatever, and that he had been treated unfairly based on a uh, TV documentary that he did, which he felt was edited to show him in a very bad light that hurt his career. And although that was certainly not what I was looking for in the interview, it certainly came out in the interview. That said, I had just seen him perform, and he performed brilliantly. Mm -hmm. uh, he, I don't think he ever really lost a step on that. And some of his, his mom, he even 
said Bob Newhart had uh, stolen the uh, person on the phone from him. I mean, really? I mean, uh, I'm blanking the man's name. But the, 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 to oh, the Toastmaster, uh, George Jessel, Georgie Jessel. George, yeah. He was doing that before either, long before either of them had. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. You know, I think a cone on the phone, which is another one that we have on the, the comedy box, uh, that was Jewish voice. Uh, they were doing phone gags back in the 1920s. To, to claim that you invented the phone gag is, shows a certain sense of yourself that I have trouble with. Uh, I'm drawing a blank because I want to follow up with it. Was it called the bi, bi, uh, the circuit uh, that was the Jewish the Borscht Belt? Borscht Belt. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, did Did you get the chance being being Jewish, being comedic? There was certainly was a, a uh, when you got started a bunch of those guys still alive. Did you get a chance to to talk to any of those guys? I've I've spoken to a few. I've spoken with Jackie Mason, uh, who is about as quintessentially Borscht Belt you're gonna, as you're going to get. Uh, I mean, I'm a little young for the Borscht Belt. When I was a kid, uh, we had a cousins club thing that went up to uh, the Concord. We stayed in the slums of the Concord, where it was cheap. And they had, you know, the comedian. Uh, I've listened, obviously, to lots and lots of the recordings of these people. I haven't spoken to too many. Uh, but I have read a lot about the area. And, you know, comedy is, as we were talking about, an evolution. You know, for many years, the Borscht Belt, and it wasn't just the Borscht Belt. There was the Minestrone Circuit, which was Italian resorts in the Catskills. There was the Chitlin Circuit, which was black clubs and such. And they formed, and they all were going on simultaneously. There were others as well. Uh, sometimes, especially, you know, the various Catskill ones, comedians would move back and forth between them. But that was before there were comedy clubs. You, you, that's where you went to learn your craft. Uh, my grandpa, my mom's dad, uh, was sent to the Catskills by his doctor for a rest one summer and spent the summer playing poker with Sid Caesar, who was in the band. He played the clarinet in the band there. I wish I could say they were meant friends for their whole life. They didn't. But uh, my grandpa liked to tell that story. Uh, so Mel Brooks, Sid Caesar, the, the whole Your Show of Shows crew, which is probably the most influential show in the entire history of comedy. Uh, you get Neil Simon, Mel Brooks, Carl Reiner, uh, Danny Simon, uh, the guy who created the TV show MASH, whose uh, name I'm blanking. Um, all of these come out of your show shows. They all came out of the Borscht Belt. But that evolved. We started to uh, develop you know, clubs, nightclubs, not just in New York, but around the country. And those people evolved there. You got Danny Thomas and people like that who grew up in those. Uh, that leads to a response that eventually, not directly, but eventually leads to the improv and Catch a Rising Star and the comic strip, which becomes big and that creates comedy clubs all over the country. That leads us to Saturday Night Live, uh, which leads to an, a, a rise in improv clubs around the country. And it just it goes on and on from there. <coughs> And so we, you, you can, and in fact, the Comedy Center does a wonderful job of this on their big board where you can connect things together. Uh, it, it is very easy to trace the comedians who will be performing tonight back to the Borscht Belt and before uh, because everything influences everything. Comedy, does, I, I mean, my wife and I watch a lot of 1930s movies. And... Some of them are really good and some of them are really bad, but that's true today too. But most of them you couldn't make today. Uh, you know, when we listen to 1950s music on Sirius, if you released that today, no one would ever hear it. But it was the hugest thing there was 60 years ago. That doesn't mean now it's bad. It means tastes have changed mm -hmm. and we have moved on. Uh, but there's still groups who love that. Musically, we live in a unique time and have for a few decades now. It used to be there was the music your parents liked. And then you were born and came up and you got new music. You hated your parents' music. Your parents hated your music. And then, you know, that generation passed and you became the parent. And now you hated your kids' music and they hated your music. Now everything exists simultaneously. 
because we have the bandwidth for it, because we have enough stations and Sirius and all that. So, you know, artists that, you know, I grew up with, you know, my kids listen to. Uh, nothing goes away anymore. We just add, which is interesting because it means everything gets to influence everything. And, you know, that's going to lead us places. Who knows where it leads us? How'd you get into the kids' entertainment business? Oh, my. Uh, well, I was at the Big Time Big Deal music firm, and Whitney Houston's manager had some friends who were doing kid stuff and sent them to the office because we represented Whitney. And I was the only one in the office with kids, so they gave it to me. <laughs> you must know something about this. No, I don't, but yeah, fine. That, that came in, that act. And I worked with them, and I liked them. It's nice. And the, the uh, producer for that act had several other acts, and he then now brought them to me, not just the office, but to me. And one of those acts introduced me to a lot of the other acts, and suddenly I'm now doing kids' entertainment. One of the things I liked about it was, you know, no kids' act ever walked into my office and said, I know the three chords, where's my million-dollar contract? Mm -hmm. You would get that with pop acts all the time. Uh, they, it was nice. It was, I was also, Billboard once described me as America's leading children's entertainment lawyer. But I was kind of America's only children's entertainment <laughs> lawyer. Uh, and it's easy to lead the parade when you are the parade. Uh, but it was, it was a little niche. It was mine. I found a group of people with no real sense of industry. I don't mean like hard work. I mean like trade association. So I founded a trade association for the industry then. Started putting on conferences for it. And, well, I still do a fair amount of that. I don't do as much as I used to because the market has changed. I watch the major record labels get into it three or four times and get out of it uh, four or six times. And, but today, a lot of the record industry has become what the kids' industry was. Because there, they would produce their own music. They have the, their own CDs created or cassettes at the time. And then they do concerts and they sell them out of the trunk of their car afterwards at the merch table. And you know, everybody was, oh, that's very nice. You stay over. But that's the whole industry now. Uh, there's, you know, there's very little hard product sold these days. The majors have much smaller rosters. And a lot of pop acts are now doing exactly what the kids' market did. I got now, actually, because of my website, when the people search, like, children and entertainment and they find me and I get calls from people who want me to help them do contracts because their kid is about to do something. And, you know, of course, it's just another form of entertainment law, so I do. But my, when I say kids entertainment, I always meant more people that entertain kids rather than kids that entertain. Nickelodeon, not the Olsen twins. But it, it was, I mean, it still is, I still have friends in it. Uh, but it was a fun area to play in because it was the Wild West and you could help shape an in, a segment of an industry. And that held great appeal for me. Wow, Wes, speaking of that, uh, with, with the internet, the uh, constant outlay of, of, of just entertainment, copyright issues, trademark issues, when I can literally pretend that I can sing and Brian can record me and next thing you know, within 30 seconds, I'm on YouTube. And, and that's about how long you'll stay on YouTube, too, yeah. if you're recording someone else's song. Yeah, but that's, I mean, the point is, it's, it's all out there. I mean, I don't know how do you regulate, how do you control, how do, how, how do even the artists these days, the days of buying vinyl and DVDs and CDs and all that stuff, are, they just seem to be passe. It is. Almost all the money's in streaming these days. Yeah. Uh, or, or download to own, but mostly streaming. How do you police? That is the big question. I mean, I'm old enough to have watched the internet come in and watched the music industry crumble because of it. The music industry started out basically going, you know, stay away uh, when it came to the internet. I think you couldn't because music was small enough bandwidth that you could, you could pirate it. Uh, film had a little time in which to figure this all out because the bandwidth was such that to pirate a movie would take you like six years. But you could do a, you could do a song, much less data. And ultimately, the record companies would all say, we will not go online. We will, we will hold the dam up with our bare hands. You know, iTunes f literally forced them to. 
by saying, look, we're going to do this whether you let us or not. We'll pay you. Uh, so if you want to get paid, come on board, and they did. Uh, but how do they police it? As best they can. Uh, YouTube has taken great steps of late to try and do that. When Google first bought YouTube, those of us in the industry said, what are they doing? They're just buying you know, a gazillion lawsuits, uh, a Googleplex of lawsuits. And the, uh, they've installed a lot of tech to help deal with that. They've also created licensing programs. I actually had a uh, conversation with a client yesterday who's got a problem here, because I won't name names, but the artist's best known song has been appropriated and lyrics changed and put on YouTube as part of a rap song. And, the, and they claim they licensed it. And we're being told by the people who are licensing, we didn't license that. Yeah. So when I get back, we're going to have to deal with that. Uh, but it, it can be a mess. I mean, again, I'm old, so I remember when sampling was, you know, people go, I'm just sampling that. And we're all going, no, no, that's called copyright infringement. I mean, there's a name for it. We don't need a new fancy name. And the courts ultimately agreed. And now almost all samples are licensed. But you do get into issues, and you know, I was talking with, about this with Mark Russell yesterday, of parody, which is you know, how Mark made, made his living, uh, what I did when I was doing stand-up which doesn't require licensing because it's fair use under the Copyright Act. Uh, I often tell my students that once you learn intellectual property law, you never see the world the same way again. Because just as we were talking about levels of seeing comedy in the arts, I look at a product and I see, oh, look, there's a bottle of soda. Great. Oh, it's called this? How do they get the rights to have that name? Isn't that bottle too close to the shape of the Coke bot? And, when I was, in, when I, you, you, you may appreciate this, having been a 1L law student yourself, uh, I had just started law school, and I was home uh, visiting my parents for the weekend. I didn't live far. And my mom and I are walking through Macy's, and they have the, the names of the departments are the big signs high up above. And one of them was called My Personal Property. And I pointed to that and said to my mother, that is a conclusion of law. And she hit me in the head with an umbrella, which, of course, was the appropriate response. Uh, because we see things like that. I mean, who else, I mean, other than a lawyer, looks at a, a phrase, my personal property, goes, well, that, that's a, whether or not that is, is a conclusion of law. Uh, it's a different way of looking at the world. And as long as you don't lose the ability to look at it like a regular person, it can be a lot of fun to look behind things. What's next for you? you, you you're into kind of a little bit of everything. You enjoy a lot of things. What, what gets you energized in the morning? Uh, not coffee. Uh, I don't drink that. What's next? I, does there need to be a next? I'm doing it. I'm doing, happy doing what I do. Uh, I don't know. And that maybe that's a great idea. I mean, I, I never know. I mean, I teach. I teach for a whole bunch of different schools in addition to Cornell and, uh, and Syracuse. I teach online for National Paralegal College and National Jersey University. So I teach a lot. I practice law. I have some great clients. Uh, I'm involved with a bunch of organizations, including the National Comedy Center. Uh, what's next? I guess the next thing. I mean, if you want what's next, I can tell you what's next. The next thing is, since I've announced it, I now have to actually write the book that I announced yesterday, I have, which will, is going to be called The Court Jester, Serious Law for Funny People. And it's, uh, I have like, a lot of the research already done. I have to sit down and write it. Uh, there are many legal handbooks for different areas of the arts. Uh, you can pick up you know, many handbooks on law for musicians. There's some for dancers and actors. There's none for comedians. It doesn't exist. I've looked. Uh, so I'm going to create it because it should exist. And because there are issues, especially copyright related issues, that are specific to the comedy area. Uh, you know, what constitutes stealing when it comes to a joke? What are the penalties? What should you do? Then you get into the, the basics, contract, law, and you know, liability, and all the rest of that defamation. Uh, maybe even you know, a bit on the uh, Pacifica thing we were talking about yesterday, so comedians know what they can and can't do on the radio, because uh, you know, that's important to know. So next, that's probably next. I'm, I'm, next, I will become a published author. That, that's, I haven't done that yet. Why not? That's kind of cool. I mean, the reality is that uh, you've identified an area which is, is prevalent, the actual genre of comedy and people screaming and yelling. You could tell, you know, the first chapter could be all these guys who 
claim somebody else stole their property, did they or didn't they? I mean, that's this the perfect setup. Or did they in such a way that it violates the law? Yeah, yeah. I, it used to be, this is one of my favorite comedy factoids. During the age of vaudeville, uh, they didn't worry about things like the copyright law, if you were a stand-up comic. They had their own self-policing system. Every comic had to write down their, their routine, and they put it in an envelope, it was sealed, and it was dated, and put into the vault of one of the biggest booking agencies in the country. And if there was a dispute between two comics over, somebody stole my joke, they would get their envelopes out of the vault, they would check to see if they both had it. If one had it, one didn't. The one who had it wins. If they both had it, then the one with the earlier envelope wins, and the other one has to stop using it. If they don't stop using it, nobody books them. That's a great self-policing system. Yeah, that's a great story. But we don't have that anymore. Uh, so now we resort to things like courts. When it comes to just the, the documenting of a, of a joke, so many folks, maybe so George Carlin, Joan Rivers, others, I mean, they got three by five cards up to, you know, they, they take it very seriously. You got the classic Bob Hope card file that went on for miles. Yeah, and then there are those who, even Lou Black, who kind of agreed, you know, it didn't have that precision, you know, the, the, that old concept of musicality, but the, the precision of it all. And it gets to be much more extemporaneous. Um, and how does he protect himself? It's just it's recorded, I guess. It's well, well, certainly that part's true. I mean, copyright go, uh, requires that it be fixed in a tangible medium. Uh, copyright, let's see if I can do this off the top of my head. The expression of an idea fixed in a tangible medium. Because uh, it's not the idea itself. And that's where you get into issues with comedy. Because in comedy, it's easy to just switch out a few words and is that enough to protect you on copyright? And the answer is, you know, if I change the name Bob to the name Steve, probably not. If I change enough of it so it's a different joke, I mean, you have uh, Henny Youngman's Take My Wife, Please. And then you get to Andy, uh, Andy Kaufman when he's doing uh, the foreign man character going, take my, take my wife, please take her. Uh, you know, Different joke, different emphasis, different reason for the laugh. I don't think, I am not aware of any judicial ruling that goes into that level of sophistication on an individual joke. Uh, even the recent dispute with Conan O'Brien didn't get a decision, they settled it. Uh, it's a really tough area of copyright law to succinctly describe. Uh, but that's one of the things I'm going to have to try and do in the book. So we'll see how well I do. Well, that'll put you in a class by yourself. And you'll, you'll be on tour at every, every college in the world. Right. Because God knows college students really want somebody up there explaining to them how to steal a joke. How to steal a joke, exactly. With that safe harbor. <laughs> that's what you're looking at. What's the question I should be asking him right now? What's the question you would like to have answered? She tells me she loves me. She's not going to give you that question. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. What's a question people would know if they, if they do something like this with you? What, what, what should they ask you? First, you're assuming people do something like this with me. It's, they don't. Nobody cares. Uh, they should, well, I appreciate that. Uh, you're good at discovering the diamond in the rough. Uh, you've actually, I mean, I, I'm impressed with the research you've done. I mean, normally I'm the one doing the interviewing. Uh, you know, Steve Allen once accused me of being with the CIA for the number of things I turned up about him. Uh, so you, you've dug deep there. I, I, I appreciate that.